Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see everyone here after that nice dinner last night and the good interaction we had with the Director General of the IAEA, Yuki Amano, and the very nice introduction that Lise Doucette provided for uh, Director General Amano's comments. So today we are here to discuss the 2015 NPD Review Conference, which took place in New York in April and May this year, and the future of nuclear disarmament. Nuclear disarmament was one of, was one of the most hotly discussed uh, issues uh, at this review conference, in addition to the Middle East zone free of uh, nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. We have here a very excellent uh, panel. All three of the speakers uh, were at this review conference. Uh, Ambassador Benno Lagner, who is the head of the security division at the Foreign Ministry of Switzerland, was the chair of subsidiary body one, which dealt with nuclear disarmament and looked to the forward-looking part of the review conference, looking for recommendations and suggested actions for the period 2015 to 2020. Uh, Ambassador Lagner produced a very good report, but the fury of some of the nuclear weapon states against that report shocked everyone. Uh, there wasn't agreement uh, on where we would go from 2015, uh, how we would build upon the success of 2010 and the 2000 Review Conference. Uh, after Ambassador Lagner will be Gaukar Mukhachdanova. She is the director of the International Organizations and Nonproliferation Program at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies at Monterey. Uh, she was with the delegation of Chile, and she's attended previous NPT meetings as a delegate uh, with Kazakhstan. And then rounding up uh, the comments will be Professor Dr. Harold Mueller, who is the founding director of the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt. He recently stepped down and is now a member of the executive board of the Peace Research uh, Institute. So th this review conference was uh, an interesting meeting from many different perspectives. Some people thought it wasn't very well organized, that there was a disconnect uh, between the chairs, the president, and several of the delegations. Um, and it reminded me of a previous review conference, which was in 2005, which unfortunately was an abject failure. But at that review conference, one of the nuclear weapon states came up and said that in their version of Article 6 of the NPT, there was no comma. And as you know, there is a comma that separates the obligation for pursuing negotiations in good faith and effective measures for nuclear disarmament, and then comma and also general and complete disarmament. So yesterday I found an interesting little poem of six lines which sort of alludes to that, and to a certain extent, I think it could also apply to this year's review conference, even though people uh, disagreed over other issues rather than whether or not a comma existed in Article 6. So here goes. The misuse of the humble comma lends license to the nuclear bomber. A comma in its proper place can serve to save the human race. But have you ever seen a civilization risk destruction through punctuation? <laughs> so with that... Introduction, <laughs> Ambassador Lagner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tariq, and uh, good morning, everybody. I would like to sort of structure my remarks in three parts. First, I'm um, looking at the review conference. Secondly, uh, saying something about what the implications are of the failure, failure of adopting a consensus outcome document. And finally, sort of saying a few words on where we are now, six months after the review conference and after the first committee. Starting with the review conference, there were obviously huge differences of views between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states going into the review conference. And coming out of the review conference, we are now left with an even stronger polarization and hardening of positions. The non-nuclear weapon states had very high expectations going into the review conference. They were frustrated with what they saw as a slow pace of implementation of past commitments, disappointment with the uneven implementation of the 2010 action plan, and given the current modernization plans, questioning how seriously the nuclear weapon states are still committed to the unequivocal undertaking 
of eventually eliminating their nuclear arsenals. The nuclear weapon states, on the other hand, argued that the action plan had to be seen as a long-term roadmap to be implemented, and that given the current international context, they were unable to offer more in terms of um, commitments regarding nuclear disarmament. This, uh, so we had on the one hand this, one, this difference concerning the implementation of past commitments. There were two other issues that were really at the center of the debate that also highlighted the differences. One was how to deal with the humanitarian dimension. The discussions on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons clearly have been the most significant development over the last review, over the last period of, of the review cycle. Originating in a 2010 outcome document with the recognition of the humanitarian dimension, followed up with three conferences in Oslo, Nayarit, Vienna, and joint statements in the review, process, review cycle process as well as in the General Assembly. Clearly, the non-nuclear weapon states saw that the momentum that had built up with these discussions on the humanitarian dimension made it important to have a very substantive and forward-looking outcome document at the review conference. The nuclear weapon states, on the other hand, had resisted really engaging in this discussion of the humanitarian dimension. They had called it a diversion, a distraction from implementing the action plan. One of the nuclear weapon states even called it an aggressive campaign. Yes, it is true that the US and the UK had participated in the conference in Vienna, but they didn't see the humanitarian dimension as really a game changer. So the question was how would the humanitarian dimension be reflected in the outcome document, both in terms of the review part, but also in terms of conclusions to be drawn going forward. The second issue that was really at the center of discussions on the disarmament pillar was the discussion on effective measures. Now this um, discussion had been initiated by the New Agenda Coalition with a working paper at the 2014 PREPCOM. And there, three points were of particular controversy. The question of whether there was a legal gap or not. Secondly, what effective measures meant. Were effective measures meant to be legal provisions to advance the implementation of Article 6? Or were effective measures to be understood as being something broader, not only legal provisions, but also practical building blocks? And thirdly, what would be the right mechanism to advance the debate on effective measures. So we had the polarization of views. We had, on the other hand, an absence of a strong group of countries being able to play a bridge building role. Yes, there were some individual countries that attempted to play this bridge building role, but there was no strong group of countries doing this, unlike in 2000 when the New Agenda Coalition played a bridge building role. NPDI saw themselves as a bridge builder, and were desirous to play that role, but unable to do so at the review conference because of the tensions within the group. This meant that there was little chance of finding meaningful common ground. And the draft final document that was finally put on the table by the president was not the result of a negotiated compromise, but the president's best guess or best effort to put on the table what she felt was generally acceptable. How did the discussions actually take place? Well, as uh, most of you know, there, there was, of course, main committee one and subsidiary body one, the main committee tasked with looking at the, doing the backward-looking review, and the subsidiary body focusing on forward-looking proposals. There was a lot of overlap in the discussions. Repetition, the same points were made over and over again. So it became quite obvious that it would be impossible to adopt a substantive document in the main committee and subsidiary body. At the beginning of the last week, the president set up a small group, a disarmament focus group of 19 states, in order to try and see where compromises could be reached. But in this small disarmament focus group, positions were repeated again. 
so it was not possible to come up with an agreed text in this group, which left the President with no other option than to put her own paper on the table. Now, I'm not going to go into the question of why the outcome document um, failed. Of course, we know that the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada blocked the Middle East section. There have been conflicting views on whether there would have been consensus or not consensus on the disarmament part of the document. But we are, the fact is that we now are left without a outcome document of the review conference. So what are the implications of this? I think the lack of an outcome document was a missed opportunity to anchor the humanitarian dimension as a unifying narrative. Yes, the text on the humanitarian dimension in the draft final document was much weaker than many of the countries that had been um, promoting the humanitarian dimension had hoped for. But it still contained some remarkable elements. It clearly described the humanitarian dimension as being a key factor for moving forward, for lending urgency to disarmament efforts. Getting the nuclear weapon states to sign up to this text would have definitely been a major step forward compared to the language in the, on the humanitarian dimension in the 2010 um, outcome document. There has, is no agreement on new steps forward as a second element. A third element, there is no agreed schedule for reporting in the current review cycle. The draft final document not only called for reports to be presented at the 2017 and 2019 PREDCOMs, but also in terms of reporting requirements, it went well beyond what nuclear weapon states had previously accepted. Fourth point, the failure of having an outcome document means there is no roadmap on how to move forward on the Middle East WMD free zone. And finally, the failure of having an outcome document at this year's review conference puts, of course, a lot more pressure on the 2020 review conference. So where do we stand now six months after the review conference? Well, the first committee has confirmed the polarization and also the deep mistrust that is there between nuclear weapon states and a considerable part of the non-nuclear weapon states. The humanitarian dimension has not become the unifying factor. The resolutions that were presented at the first committee have actually even more fragmented the support for the humanitarian dimension. So what do we need to do now? Well, first of all, we need to remind ourselves that the disarmament commitments in the final documents of the earlier review conferences remain valid and need to be fully implemented. In that sense, it would be helpful if the P5 were to come up at the next meeting with a clear commitment on going forward on the implementation of these, of these commitments, and also to come up with a clear commitment to voluntary reporting over the current review cycle. As I mentioned, we have no reporting schedule set out because the outcome document was not adopted. Secondly, there is definitely a need for a dialogue to address the deep gap between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. The open-ended working group would be the ideal forum to address this huge gap which is why Switzerland, together with other countries, has supported the establishment of this open-ended working group. Unfortunately, the discussions at the first committee on how the resolution was adopted regarding the setting up of the open-ended working group does not all go well. If we look at the voting pattern on this resolution, um, we have seen that there is clearly more opposition to this resolution than there was in 2012. So much will depend on how actually the discussions will be carried out. But I think even despite their opposition to the resolution, it will be very important to have the engagement of the nuclear weapon states because the dialogue needs to be conducted in a constructive and inclusive manner. And finally, there has to be a resumption 
of the process on the Middle East WMD free zone. I was struck by the lack of discussion on this issue at the first committee. People seem to be at a loss of how to resume this process. But the 2020 review conference may seem far away, but if there are no serious attempts to restart the dialogue on this issue over the next year or so, it will be very difficult to see how we can move towards a productive conference in 2020. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Benno, and thank you very much for keeping to Swiss timing. It's exactly 10 minutes, and thank you for a succinct but uh, wide-ranging overview of the proceedings of this review conference. Our next speaker is uh, Gaukar Vukacilanova. Thank you, Tariq, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity to speak today about the review conference. Um, and uh, it's really an honor to share the panel with these distinguished speakers. I must confess, confess in a conversation with a friend the other day, I had to describe my, uh, my condition as something of a post-REFCON stress disorder. Um, and, and I didn't even have to negotiate, so my sympathies are, are to those uh, diplomats who, who were there, and some of you are in the room. Um, so uh, almost six months uh, afterwards, it's, it's st it still all looks very foggy, and there, there's a bit of a bad taste after the review conference. Um, and a lot of the reasons for, for that have already been covered by Ambassador Lagner. I, try, I will try not to repeat too much of uh, what, what he said and, uh, and highlight some of the observations from the REFCON. Um, as was mentioned, the, the central debates, the central uh, two issues for the review conference were going to be, and indeed turned out to be, the Middle East and, and nuclear disarmament, neither of which was, was surprising, and indeed nuclear disarmament has, has always been the central topic for the review conferences. It was one of the reasons we even have the review process um, built into the NPT structure in the first place. Uh, Middle East stole the show in the end uh, from nuclear disarmament, becoming sort of the main reason the, the document was not adopted, at least on the surface of it. Uh, but throughout the conference, the Middle East discussions were taking place primarily behind the scenes, and most delegations um, and civil society were unaware of, of what's going on, how close we are to a possible solution, and, and that actually played into this final day dynamic about whether or not we will actually adopt uh, a final document, and for at least from somewhat on, from the outside, it seemed like we were very close to, to having a consensus, even given the uh, widespread unhappiness of non-nuclear weapon states with, uh, with the draft presented by the President. Uh, while the Middle East was taking, uh, well, the Middle East discussions were taking place in the shadows, the disarmament debate was front and center throughout the review conference. Um, and in particular, the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and related issues to that of the um, risk of use of nuclear weapons, accidental or otherwise, uh, proposals to begin negotiations or at least somehow substantively and seriously discuss options for a legally binding instrument to implement Article 6 of the NBT as proposed primarily by the New Agenda Coalition but also supported by um, a large number of non-nuclear weapon states active in the humanitarian initiative. And uh, debates, as uh, Ambassador Lagner said, were, were hard, both substantively and, and atmospherically, and highlighted the divisions, uh, quite profound divisions between, uh, among members, uh, member states going into the review conference, and those divisions became only worse during the review conference. And those divisions were not just because, uh, just, just between nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. It wasn't your kind of classical divide. Uh, there were very serious disagreements among the non-nuclear weapon states, among different groups. Uh, very often it fell along the lines of U.S. allies or nuclear umbrella states versus, versus the rest, but even within the, the rest group, um, you could see fractures forming, and as the conference went on, um, those fractures, I think, were becoming bigger, and about six months later, uh, that is, I think, is presenting a serious problem to some of these groups. What were the main points of contention? Um, as mentioned before, large gaps in perception of urgency of nuclear disarmament. Uh, completely polar different views from, from a number of states. Large majority of states sought a recognition that the humanitarian impact um, and humanitarian discourse indeed lends much greater urgency to nuclear disarmament measures than we've, than we've previously um, thought. And, uh, and that indeed humanitarian dimension should underpin all nuclear disarmament discussions and measures. The nuclear weapon states um, 
in their fury, as Tariq said, <laughs> um, disagreed, some ferociously, some less so, uh, with uh, the importance of the humanitarian dimension to the nuclear disarmament measures discussion, uh, to the centrality of this topic uh, to the future discourse, with there being any serious risk of accidental use of, of nuclear weapons, and uh, of course with the existence of the so-called legal gap and the need to close it with some kind of a new instrument. Uh, so nuclear weapon states demonstrated a decidedly different perception of, of urgency of nuclear disarmament, and I think that was the deepest wedge between the countries. Um, this was all exacerbated by the minimum results coming out of the P5 process over five years, and with the nuclear arsenal modernization programs in every nuclear weapon state, um, and also recent national pronouncements about the centrality of nuclear weapons, the value of nuclear weapons to the uh, nation's uh, security and, and sovereignty. So all that was really sending a, a, a bad message to nuclear weapon states. And on the issue of uh, the misplaced comma or uh, disputed comma, it was evident that the Russian Federation was not quite past that debate yet because they insisted that the, the orphan child of the NPT is the general and complete disarmament and that's what we really should be focusing on so that didn't help the debate at all either. And, um, and as the conference went on and, and they were, there were no points of, of connection, it seemed like we as an NPT community came to a certain breaking point, a point of no return where disarmament debates moved well beyond a familiar ground of discussion about the next step, incremental step, and its, relevant pro, uh, it, it its relative uh, priority or significance and, and firmly placed ourselves in the, in the area of profound disagreements on the very legitimacy of nuclear Me too. Um, <laughs> the, so we moved basically from the discussion of what should be the next incremental step, is it FMCT and what's the scope of FMCT, things like that. We moved into the area of profound disagreement on the legitimacy of nuclear weapons as um, a national or international instrument of security. Uh, and related to that, of course, the very legality of, of nuclear weapons. So you, you had a lot of debate concentrated on, on, on whether or not nuclear weapons are legitimate at all. And that is the kind of gap that is significantly harder, if at all possible, to bridge with um, however skillful diplomatic language uh, you can craft. Um, that is a philosophical uh, disagreement that, is, that you can't hash over with um, good enough negotiations in the back room. And so it wasn't too surprising that the focus group on disarmament that negotiated separately in the Algerian mission in the end couldn't agree on, on anything. And as Ambassador Lagner pointed out, the document that came out of the, president, uh, of the mission uh, by the president was not a product of, of consensus, it wasn't a product of agreement, it was an attempt at sort of a best guess of where states could, could meet. There was widespread dis, uh, dissatisfaction with the text, particularly on how the humanitarian dimension was uh, dealt with, and the language on the establishment of an open-ended working group that could potentially deal with the question of do we need a legally binding instrument to implement Article 6 and, or, or some kind of other measure. Nevertheless, notwithstanding that disagreement and dissatisfaction, it seemed like we were this close to actually having a document. Um, and because the burden of blocking it seemed to have rested on non-nuclear weapon states, on those who were unhappy with the text. And for all the dissatisfaction, it looked like the non-nuclear weapon states were not in a position to, to block the text. Middle East, as I mentioned before, was part of the reason. Because of lack of information, it seemed to many non-nuclear weapon states that some kind of a solution was at hand, that it wasn't clear that the United States was unhappy enough with the draft that it was prepared to, to reject it. And so that wasn't clear until the very end. And a number of non-nuclear weapon states seem to have had instructions not to you know, wreck the conference if there is a Middle East solution. More broadly, however, this situation demonstrated that there are still very high political costs to, to blocking consensus at, an, at a uh, review conference and most non-nuclear weapon states are not prepared to pay that, um, that cost, individually at least. There was one ambassador who summed it up beautifully and he said that there are very few of us in the room who can say that we find an outcome unacceptable at any cost. So that pretty much summed up the position of many non-nuclear weapon states. And despite all the momentum generated behind the humanitarian initiative, 
that group was still not able to organize some kind of collective action to, to, to together to block the adoption of the text that they didn't like. So they needed a leader. Yeah. That raises, I think, serious questions about the future of the humanitarian initiative and, and its potential um, to pursue measures that they seem to want to pursue, or at least the, the main major actor want, actors want to pursue, and implications for measures like the open-ended working group and what, what it could achieve and what it could discuss. Um, and so far, we seem to have no bridge builders. The debates at the first committee uh, that just concluded um, were very much the continuation of the situation from the review conference and exacerbated in many ways and highlighted in many ways all the divisions that uh, started to become obvious at the review conference. Uh, the middle ground right now looks like a wasteland or, or sort, sort of a yeah, masked minefield enter at your own risk. Um, J Japan kind of learned it the, high, the, the hard way, stepping into it, trying to build some bridges and getting sort of slapped on the wrist for, for including the humanitarian dimension in their resolution that used to be kind of the most supported one on nuclear disarmament. So where do we go from here and what, what are the implications? Well, there are some implications for the review, con review process in particular. If we have indeed reached the point of incompatible positions, how do we come back from there to the next review conference? Do we simply hope that this will all blow over and the humanitarian initiative will dissipate and we'll pretend that, that we can go back to the business of, as usual of in, in discussing incremental steps? Should we do that? Is that, is that the solution for the, for the regime? And if we cannot come back from that point, what is the meaning of the review process where you come in divided and you come out equally divided or even more divided. What does that to do to the credibility of the treaty and the review process itself? What, what, are, what are the implications for the long-term participation of non-nuclear weapon states in the kind of process where they, they know they're not going to get anything out? And, uh, and as Ambassador Lachlan said, there is this opportunity now with the Open and Working Group. There are also risks. Now, the, the resolution was adopted among great acrimony and disagreement about what the open-ended working group should do, what kind of mandate should it have, whether it should operate by consensus. So now there's a risk that once it convenes, it will get bogged down in deciding exactly that. What are we going to do? Are we going to try to negotiate? Which topics are we going to cover? Before it even convenes, the question is, will the states that abstained uh, ultimately decide to participate? Because these are a lot of the U.S. allies that do talk about the need to find this middle ground um, and, and bridge the differences or at least um, have some different perspectives on, on nuclear weapons and their legitimacy. Will the nuclear weapon states, at least some of them, reconsider their position and participate regardless of, of having voted against the resolution? And if they decide not to do that, as they did with the previous open-ended working group, then what else do we have? And, and, and so far, I, I don't have anything optimistic, optimistic to say except to um, call on those who abstained, voted against, to consider participating um, and not treat the rules of procedure as a threat against the national security. And also highlight maybe the opportunity for civil society to, to have an input into, into how the open and working group is structured, what kind of issues it addresses, and the manner in which it, it can do so. On that note, I think I'm over time. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Gothar, and thank you for adding texture um, to the discussion on what led to the collapse of the review conference. And now, uh, Harold, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start with reflecting for a moment uh, about the depths of the substantial positions which are dividing the NPT parties along the huge uh, fault line uh, identified by the humanitarian initiative. Um, the humanitarian initiative in the end is a consequence um, by a large majority uh, over what they see as the complete failure of the previous disarmament strategy to bring things to an end. The step-by-step -step approach, I must say, as a political analyst, is politically completely plausible. As most changes in world history were done by step-by-step, -by -step, 
and if they weren't done by step by step, they were fairly unpleasant most of the time. So it's politic politically plausible, but it's today seen by the majority uh, as a simple pretense uh, to avoid going to zero. And similarly, the argument that disarmament needs the right conditions uh, is completely plausible in itself, but it does not cut ice with the majority because the conditions which disfavor disarmament steps are to, to a large degree caused by actions of the most powerful states, and that is incidentally the nuclear weapon states. And I have only to point uh, to the two conditions which today might be the strongest impediments for going forward with nuclear disarmament, the Ukraine crisis, and the situation in the South China Sea, to see the hands of the nuclear weapon states involved there. The disarmament steps in the five years before the uh, 2050 review were no doubt quantitatively significant, but they were seen by many, meanwhile, uh, as just adjusting the de deterrence posture to current circumstances and not at all by a serious intention, uh, motivated by a serious intention to go towards zero. On the other hand, the refusal by the non-aligned to improve the non-proliferation toolbox in any way as long as disarmament does not proceed uh, honors no doubt the principle that the NPT is a bargain, but it's at the same time a very cheap way to avoid useful but possibly burdensome measures. We have to realize that the humanitarian approach today attracts the overwhelming majority of the member states, and the humanitarian pledge attracts a sizable majority. But at the same time, uh, the group in opposition, namely the nuclear weapon states plus their allies, um, represent, if you call them representative, uh, a majority of mankind in their states. This was pointed to by the French ambassador during the conference. Uh, he did not earn much applause for that, but quantitatively, quantitatively uh, he was of course right. Now, the summary of all that is the parties today are highly polarized on the issue, uh, and the polarization was certainly exacerbated by strategic miscalculations on either side uh, the all too long refusal of all nuclear weapon states to at least engage with the humanitarian initiative uh, on the conferences and compliments to the Brits and the Americans that they did in the end. And on the other hand, the uh, very strong trend by the initiative leaders and allied NGOs to put nuclear weapon states and their allies in the same basket uh, it's not very wise if you're looking for allies. And I can tell you as a member of the German delegation that it, is, uh, it has a psychological impact when you are put together with the rest. Uh, I was tempted to buy a button um, with, the, with, the, with the sign weasel uh, on it just to protest against this tactic. Now, wh where do we go from here? Uh, I think it's important to realize that despite, uh, despite the polar, polarization which I just uh, explained, neither the humanitarian initiative nor the group of the nuclear weapon states and their allies are unitary. Nuclear weapon states are split on their readiness to engage in dialogue. Allies are split uh, on a very large continuum between those who are very strong sympathies uh, for the humanitarian initiative to those who insist now more than ever on extended deterrence and all that comes with it. Uh, and there's no agreement there. The resolutions which were submitted to the first committee uh, in the previous weeks suggest quite a range of preferences and options. An open-ended working group with a negotiation mandate uh, and the decision rule of the General Assembly, an open-ended working group without a negotiation mandate and a consensus decision rule, a new forum outside the established disarmament uh, venues, um, an Ottawa-like grouping of like-minded countries with negotiation objectives, all that has been debated. And we have, uh, in the end, arrived at what we had before, namely 
an open-ended working group that is purely deliberative. On substance, what has been put forward is a so-called simple ban agreement, a comprehensive nuclear weapons convention, a time-bound step-by-step approach with a fixed end date, a step-by-step approach with target gates for a number of steps and all sorts of combinations thereof. I should say that, um, again, as a political analyst, I see problems with all of these approaches. Uh, when I heard, hear the word simple in connection to nuclear disarmament, uh, I tend to faint because as a seasoned observer of this scene, I know that nothing is simple there. And a simple ban consisting of uh, two or three paragraphs uh, may leave yawning gaps in verification, compliance, and enforcement, which we all would wish to avoid. A comprehensive convention will take long to negotiate, and it might prove much more contro controversial in the details, even among its promoters, uh, than many think. A time-bound step-by-step approach with a fixed end date uh, is inviting people to filibuster about the date, what might it be? And a step-by-step -step approach with target gates for a number of steps multiplies the points for filibustering, uh, which does not speak against any of them, but it just shows it's not simple. The worst thing would be business as usual that could finally split the NPT community uh, and impose immediate stagnation on a treaty which usually leads to erosion. Let me conclude but by thinking a little moment out of the box uh, or out of the straight jacket in which we all find ourselves. Could it not be possible to agree on an indicative target date for a, a zero nuclear weapons world? This is not at all without precedence. We have agreed on such target dates on the Millennium Goals. We have agreed on such target dates uh, in the Climate Convention negotiations. Uh, and this is nothing different. Of course, this is a commitment to try one's best to meet the target date. But it is not, nothing that can be uh, put before court uh, and then, then be enforced. Should it not be possible? Secondly, should it not be possible to agree on indicative target gates for certain use, useful steps on which we all agree. We did so in 1995 on the CTBT. We could do so today uh, on an FMCT, and maybe there are one or two more steps which we can agree. Um, for the European Union, uh, let me just put forward a few thoughts what could be done even so the 2015 conference showed the Union most divided ever since uh, it developed a common foreign and security policy in the non-proliferation area. Uh, I've seen the last seven conferences. Uh, the 1995 conference was the first where the Union uh, appeared in a joint fashion after France had acceded to the NPT. Uh, 2000 was a high time with a clear influence uh, of the Union on the final document. 2005, uh, we were saved by the Americans to show division. Um, but 2015 was very, very bad. So what, what could we possibly do despite polarization? Uh, we could seriously discuss whether we, we want to take the FMCT out of the city mm -hmm. and to create a separate venue to put it forward. Uh, I would not say that agreement among the EU member states is granted on that issue, but a serious discussion, I think, would make sense because we all agree we want such a treaty. Secondly, um, we could propose a procedure to address that issue of necessary conditions for nuclear abolition. Uh, it is a point which France makes very strong. It's a point on which the United Kingdom has uh, also a clear position. And it's a point where one should engage uh, between nuclear weapon state on, and non-nuclear weapon states. How would we wish a world to be in which the final step from low numbers to zero would be possible? Uh, it's an important thought exercise and it might lead to quite operational steps that should be taken to move in that direction. The EU could initiate a study on the meaning of irreversibility 
as a condition for nuclear armament. It's on the books since the year 2000. Uh, it's an interesting principle, which is us usually defined in technical terms, uh, and we, should, we could just start thinking about what it means. And I think the Union is a good place to start there, because France, among the five nuclear weapon states, uh, is a world champion in irreversibility. Uh, France has dismantled, as you know, the test side uh, and the production sites for uh, fissile material for bomb purposes. So we have something to show, and we have a starting point from which we could uh, proceed. And finally, the, uh, the, uh, the European Union could follow the British example and start uh, a major program for uh, research on this armament verification. Um, the EU has at least two institutions that are technically uh, in a very good position to, to, to do such studies. That's Euratom with its safeguarding experiences in nuclear weapon states, and of course ISPRA uh, with the Transuranium Institute. Um, and of course in the member states there is a panoply of capable research institutions that could be involved. Those, these were four steps which are, in my view, in the realm uh, of the Union, and I would hope that we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold, and thank you also for bringing the EU into the discussion and what can be done uh, by the EU uh, member states, but also the EU consortium and its member think tanks. I'm glad that you, you mentioned this reference that the French ambassador had, that the majority of the world's population lives securely under the protection of nuclear weapons. But another nuclear weapon state criticized the humanitarian initiative and the 150 plus countries that had signed on to it as populism. So they want to have it both ways. Um, I should also recall that the next review cycle begins in 2017 with the preparatory committee and there'll be another one in 2018 and 2019. So that provides another basis that we don't have to wait for five years. There will be 30 days of preparation for the next review conference but unfortunately, there is now, to invent a term, structural dysfunctionalism among many delegations in terms of understanding the review process and how to make it work. And if there is no political agreement among the states, then it doesn't matter what the review process is, they will not reach agreement. And that's why I would also argue that even by setting up an open-ended working group, just because there is an open-ended working group doesn't mean that countries will all of a sudden magically resolve their significant differences over these issues. So now, as you heard from the panel, there are divisions not only between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states, but significant new divisions have emerged within the non-nuclear weapon states themselves, within the humanitarian initiative. And therefore, we, I think, now are in a much worse position than we were before the start of the 2015 review conference. Now that my three panelists have uh, abided by their time limits, we have nearly half an hour for discussion. And if we could have the lights put up in the hall, then I can see uh, those who have raised their and I immediately see three. If it's okay with you, I will uh, take questions in three and then the three panelists can each address whichever ones that they would like so we can hopefully have as much engagement uh, from the audience as possible. So I saw Bill Potter, Tom Countryman, and Andre Belitsky, and then I will come to the second one. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Tariq, and I, I thank all of the, uh, the three panelists for their, uh, I think, astute observations. And I was really struck by the fact that I think everyone, including you, uh, Tariq, uh, observed the, the unusual disarray among the political and regional groupings. And I wonder if perhaps what we are observing is really uh, more of a, um, uh, a macro development rather than something that is simply peculiar to the last review conference or uh, the first committee. Uh, because I'm, I'm struck by the tremendous, uh, I mean really fracturing within the non-aligned movement that was most apparent in the competing resolutions that we observed uh, at the first committee on the open-ended working group and the manner in which business uh, was conducted among uh, members of the NAM. Uh, one could say much the same uh, uh, at the review conference in terms of uh, the divide among the P5 on some, uh, on some key issues. 
the New Agenda Coalition certainly uh, didn't act in concert in many respects and certainly played a, a very different role than it had previously. And Harold, you noted also the divide within the EU. And so I guess the, the question is, is this something that is simply momentary or are we observing a more fundamental kind of realignment among these political groupings? And then the other question is, is that something that's good or bad? I mean, is this something likely to uh, promote uh, progress with respect to disarmament or nonproliferation? Uh, or is it something that will be debilitating? And I would add to this the, the difficulties in the U.S.-Russian relationship, which had been a cornerstone historically for the, the NPT. So I'd be interested in, in all of you uh, commenting as you see fit uh, on whether we're observing a more macro problem here. Tom? Uh, similar question. Can we talk not just about the review process, but about the real world, which is rather a different thing? Uh, for example, the, nobody is happy about the failure to reach consensus at the review conference, but in my view, the treaty, which is what we care about, is stronger than it was a year ago because the single biggest threat to the treaty, the possibility of Iran building a nuclear weapon, has been addressed at least for the next several years. Uh, additionally, there is a false analysis that is created by the structure of the review process. And Benno's, I don't disagree with what Benno said, but it's built into his speech that the analysis is not what are the problems in the real world, but how are the five nuclear weapon states identical and all the non-nuclear weapon states identical, as if that's the only division that matters, as if it is as if all five nuclear weapon states are equally furious and uncompromising, and nobody among the non-nuclear weapon states is furious and uncompromising. The, uh, it's convenient diplomatically, I understand, to not name names and to put people in groups. It helps protect economic and political interests, but it fails to address what's really happening in the real world. And in the realm of disarmament, <clears throat> the most important development in the real world in the last five years is not the humanitarian impact movement. It is, number one, conclusion and implementation of the New START Treaty, which continues to drive down the number of nuclear weapons today. It is the conclusion of the Joint Comprehensive Program of Action. And it is the occupation by one European country of the territory of another country, and as Dr. Mueller mentioned, the resulting re-emphasis by that country of the primacy of nuclear weapons to its national image and national strength. And if you can't talk about those issues but are constrained to saying, what are the categories in New York? And what's the red versus blue scenario, uh, you have very little prospect of affecting disarmament in the real world. Thank you. Uh, Andre? Thank you so much. Pretty much all of the speakers says that now as the 2015 review conference have failed to produce a document, we do not have any plan to, for, to move forward. But uh, actually we do have something because uh, the 2010 action plan is technically still viable and there have been a lot of complaints during the review conference that this was not fulfilled and this part is not done. So maybe we can just look at this 2010 action plan, see what is not viable anymore. Clearly the part in the Middle East is sort of done and uh, maybe see how this could be implemented. We have time, we have, you know, the list of things we can do, and before we come up to something new, we might try to finish the job is what not done. Thank you. Thank you. So perhaps we can go in the order of Harold, Galkar, and Benno, and uh, you can take your pick which part you would like to answer. Harold first. Okay. Um, thanks. I, I think that uh, Tom Countryman is quite right to remind us that there is a real world outside of the negotiation room in New York. Um, I would possibly put the accent a little bit differently. Uh, I think if we remind ourselves of that, the huge obligation of the P5 
to sort out their problems becomes much more visible. And the P5 are not sorting out their problems. The P5 have now consultations on nuclear issues and I'm one of those who believe that this is moderately useful and should be continued. But it's of course, if you wish, also secluding the nuclear issue uh, and isolating it from the political circumstances under which nuclear policy in the nuclear weapon states are being made. And these are political circumstances uh, and it reflects the conflicts and disputes they have with each other, uh, including those that emerge out of alliance relations. And that's real world. One of the issues which we are discussing in Europe is of course the future fate of substrategic nuclear weapons and that is of course deeply involved uh, in the relationship between Russia and NATO and between the United States and, and uh, NATO and between the United States and their allies. And it has to be sorted out when we want to uh, move forward on the substrategic nuclear weapons. So yes, let's address the real world thing. Uh, but understand that that means heavy, heavy responsibilities uh, for the P5. And secondly, I also agree that uh, the 2010 action plan is there and alive and unfortunately remains unfulfilled in many aspects. So there is a lot, lot to do, but that should not prevent us from saying, oh, there is a 2010 action plan and that's all we have to address uh, because there is meanwhile uh, more on the agenda which also should be addressed and I welcome the open-ended working group as a very good instrument to do that. Thank you. Thank you all for the questions. Um, on the wrong analysis of nuclear weapon states being identical and non-nuclear weapon states being identical, I think all three of us highlighted in our remarks the fractures among the non-nuclear weapon states. Um, it's, it's not ignored. It's not ignored at all, and I, I've highlighted some of the challenges that it poses to the initiatives of the non-nuclear weapon states in the first place. Um, and they are, of course, fractures among nuclear weapon states, but they do have that big thing in common, having nuclear weapons and believing in uh, them providing for their security. So there are certain grounds for grouping them together to an extent. Um, as for the main disarmament developments, the New START Treaty, um, a, a great achievement that it was, the United States would be the first to recognize it was an interim measure that was necessary to keep the verification regime in place to enhance um, predictability and stability in the, in the meantime working on the next big step. And none of us has hesitated probably in criticizing Russia for refusing to taking that next step. Now, Russia has certain reasons for that, or at least it cites certain reasons for that. Um, is the NPT the right place to address that? Again, Russia and the United States would be the first ones to say, no, 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 this is not the place for, for us to address that. That's something we'll address between, uh, between ourselves or in the P5 process. So you, you can't have it both ways and come in into the NPT and say you're ignoring the real world, but we also are not going to discuss with you this because these are our strategic security issues. And that has happened with Ukraine as well. I think it was actually the US decision that the Ukraine issue does not live in the NPT review conference room, that it has to be substantially seriously addressed elsewhere. The United States voiced its discontent in the opening statement, so did some other countries, but as far as I understand, a lot of states were discouraged from bringing that issue into the NPT review conference because review conference cannot solve it. Does that point to a problem in the structure of the NPT review process? Absolutely. Do we have political will to address that problem? That doesn't seem to be the case. Maybe it's a, no, it's a big opportunity for the next review process, the review cycle. Maybe it's something we, ha we, can, we can begin addressing even before the, the first prep com. Um, but again, that needs a state leader or a group of state leaders to champion that issue and be committed to, to saying, okay, we're ready to, and to reform the process to the, to the extent that we can bring some of those issues into it. But it's, it, will not gonna be, it, it will not gonna be a purely nuclear discussion anymore. Um, and I think some states are very, very uncomfortable with that and primarily nuclear weapon states. Um, Andrei, on the 2010 action plan, I happen to be one of those unfortunates who monitored its implementation between 2012 and 2015. 
Um, and yeah, the review conference was an abject failure in actually substantively reviewing the implementation of the action plan. Um, all of these things that you mentioned, we have proposed before. Review individual actions, see what you've accomplished, see what needs refining, see, needs, or see what needs new target maybe, or a benchmark or something. And the states didn't take that up. Um, now, can we come back to that and do it in this coming review process? I have zero confidence in that. And before the 2010 action plan, we had other steps. We had 13 practical steps. Are they still valid? We're piling on those actions and, and we just don't seem to have the capacity, political capacity, to adequately review the implementation. So my, con my concern is that next time we meet in five years for the review conference, there'll be not so much a desire to review what happened since 2010, but to agree on some new steps, which I think is something that uh, Dr. Miller mentioned as well. Is it good or bad that the um, different groupings are fracturing, or is it, is it a specifically 2015 phenomenon? I think it's a combination of different factors that contributed to that. There's certainly a macro level to it. Uh, the first committee, it felt like the ground was shifting. A lot of realignment is happening. Some of it, I think, it was forced by the questions coming out of the humanitarian dimension. Um, and, and you see those that's fracturing in the, even in the New Agenda Coalition, who generally are a like-minded group on disarmament, but even there you see def varying degrees of readiness to move to, say, negotiations or, or how to go about um, even discussing that issue. The non-aligned movement was never homogenous since, I, I guess, since the Tito time or since the Harlat Nero time. Um, it was a, an idi idiosyncratic situation this time around, I think. The combination of the working group um, on disarmament chair quitting right before the conference, and Indonesia stepped down for the time being, and, 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 and Iran being the chair, both the fact that Iran had to step in at the last minute and do coordination, I think that complicated matters for Iran and the non-aligned movement, and the fact that Iran was engaged in negotiations elsewhere, so they had a much bigger fish to fry as far as they were concerned. So they were not entirely into this whole NAM coordination business. And, and, and you know, you could tell that. Um, leave it that yes, thanks. Benno? Um, Tom, you are absolutely right in saying that the nuclear weapon states are unfairly lumped together in one basket. And there are obviously differences. There are some who are willing to do more on disarmament and some who are doing, willing to do less. And you're also right in pointing out that we need to take into consideration the real world problems. It's important that these real world problems are also part of the debate. That's why I think it will be important for the nuclear weapon states to participate in the open ender working group, because that will be precisely a forum to also put these real world issues on the table so that the debate could be um, more balanced and more substantiated. On the fractioning of the groupings, I don't think it's a momentary thing. It's probably going to last. And as uh, Skalka pointed out, it's not something that is um, new, and it's also not something that is mainly just um, related to the disarmament field. I mean, you also see on other issues, um, fractioning among the NAM countries, among the G77 in the, in the United Nations, of course, on the humanitarian dimension, there was a more unitary support for the humanitarian dimension as long as it was focused on the fact-finding element, the facts-based discussion of what the humanitarian consequences meant. As soon as the discussion moves what to do with this politically, how to move forward or how to operationalize the um, conclusions from the humanitarian discussion to some forward-looking um, action, you will automatically come to a degree of fragmentation. And I think that was clearly shown also in the voting pattern on the three resolutions that address the humanitarian dimension during this first committee. There are clearly some among the supporters of the humanitarian dimension that think that you can move forward or should move forward regardless of whether everybody is on board. Um, the idea of a ban treaty, even without the participation of nuclear weapon states. There are clearly other supporters 
of the humanitarian dimension, my, dimension, and Switzerland belongs to those who think that you need to move forward in an inclusive manner, engaging the nuclear weapon states. So obviously, the more you get into terms of doing something concrete with the humanitarian discussion, you will end up in having a bigger fragmentation. Thank you. So I have on my list all those whose hands I saw, and given the time, so we have uh, Bob Einhorn, Maurizio Martellini, Martellini Ali Soltani, there's a gentleman at the back there, Patricia Lewis, Olivia Meyer, there's a lady at the back there, and Mohammed Daraye. And I think we need to close the list given the time. So for the purposes of the record keeping, could you also identify yourselves, please, when you take the microphone? So Bob. Thank you, Tarek. Bob Einhorn, uh, Brookings uh, in Washington. Um, I wonder if it's time for a fundamental rethinking of the NPT review process. I say this as someone who's represented his government at five of these conferences, including the first in 1975 and the most important one in 1995. I think one of the main problems is to regard adoption of a consensus final document as the litmus test of success or failure uh, of the conference. Um, I think that making this litmus test um, contributes um, to polarization. It contributes to hostage taking. Uh, it wastes a lot of time. Uh, and I wonder if the four weeks or however long the conference is uh, would better be spent uh, doing um, what the treaty says the review conference should do is review the operation of the treaty. How well is it working? Uh, look at geopolitical trends, technological developments that have a bearing uh, on the future of the uh, regime. Uh, try to set an agenda uh, for the future. How should various tasks be parceled out among the various for forums? Uh, where there is, you know, agreement, where decisions can be made, uh, take a few decisions, even if there's no consensus on many other issues that are discussed in the House. Um, I think, uh, you know, reform is really necessary. Uh, we have this uh, political theater uh, every five years. Uh, it has very little impact on the real world. And, you know, if, if there's a concern about the nuclear powers not discussing some of these real world issues, I think it's you know, it's up to the nuclear powers to explain themselves more. Why are they taking the positions they're taking and not only discuss it among themselves? But I think it really is time. I'd be interested in the, the views of the panel. Is it time to rethink the review process? Thank you. Maurizio? Very, uh, very interesting panel. I would like to introduce... Ah, yes, I forget. Maurizio Martellini from Italy. Uh, very interesting panel. I would like to introduce uh, another way of thinking that has been really impressed by Harald's presentation. Uh, the, a new, let's say, Weltanschauung is the scientific methodology. Fractionering, uh, regrouping, polarization in a scientific language. Uh, it means uh, a new phase space approach. When you have a complex phenomena like uh, disarmament, uh, yeah, this kind of uh, reorganization of the dynamics no, imply that uh, you need to, uh, let's say, adapt uh, uh, the, the new dynamics to the two uh, opposite uh, vision, the real world or the world of the process. And this, it means uh, to adopt, perhaps, the Harald Mueller point of view, to approach a basket, I mean, a basket way to, to analyze the future of NAPT, uh, in the sense, uh, for instance, to reinvestigate what means uh, irreversibility, what means uh, uh, fissile material catastrophe, what means, uh, let's say, phase uh, the reduction, uh, strategic reduction. So that is the point. Um, between, to, to summarize, uh, if you adopt a, a scientific methodology, it's uh, very difficult to try to solve the, let's say, the, the gap and the situation just ad putting yourself in a specific Weltanschauung or the real world or the virtual process world, and perhaps it should be time to 
have a serious rethinking on, on the whole article and, uh, and oh, in the language of Harald, uh, in some specific concept uh, like irreversibility and like stability. Thank you. Ambassador Sultania? Could you also identify yourself in the microphone, please? Thank you. The gentleman over there, yes. Thank you very much, Jacek Savic, Deputy, Deputy Perm Rep of Poland in Vienna. And it's always is, is a pleasure to take the floor as a, such, after such a great champions of the non-proliferation, of course. Uh, of course, I'm not a, I got no credentials whatsoever uh, to represent the NPDI, but my country is a member of this group, and I just I can offer one, one observation with regard to what uh, Ambassador Lagner has said about this uh, role of the group during the review conference. Uh, uh, Ambassador Lagner has said that uh, the NPDI uh, had a just uh, intention just to play the role of the honest broker, comma, but uh, couldn't deliver simply because of uh, the, the tensions among the members of the group. Actually, I had the privilege to, to take part in a number of meetings of the NPDI during the review, review, review conference. As a matter of fact, it's not the case. Uh, regardless of the fact that the group is composed of uh, five NATO countries and uh, Chile and Mexico, including the, the others, of course, uh, there was no such attention uh, which prevents the group from playing the role of an honest broker. They, want, they wanted to deliver, they wanted to play the role during the review conference, but as a matter of fact, it was impossible. It was a mission impossible at the time. Simply, uh, during that conference, uh, the, the discrepancies of views among the countries, among the key players, was, were so tangible that uh, any, uh, any honest broker couldn't deliver at the time. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, is simple, uh, just to, to maybe our three panelists. Uh, whether you see that yes, the, any kind of the honest broker in, in the new review process provided that the divisions of, of views uh, uh, of today, uh, I don't see the role of the EU for today because uh, as uh, the first committee, the recent first committee, uh, just clearly showed that, the, the, as, as uh, um, Professor Miller has mentioned, uh, uh, is, uh, the EU has been divi is divided as never been. And also, uh, it's my personal judgment, I know that it goes for the record, but uh, after 2012, uh, Ambassador Layava couldn't deliver. It was a mission impossible either. So uh, uh, just question is the, the simple one. Uh, whether there is a need for the honest broker, and if so, uh, who could play the, such a role uh, in the next review process in order to bridge the gaps? Thank you very much. Thank you. Patricia Lewis. 
Thank you, and, and thanks to all the panellists for um, very thoughtful presentations. I also wanted to address the real world, um, acknowledging that everyone has different realities. Um, but from in, in our world, in our nuclear-obsessed world, um, the real world is one in which nuclear weapons are beginning to increase in salience again. They're being used as part of a pattern of uh, threats again, and the risks of use uh, may be rising, and certainly they're becoming increasingly understood in their fuller range of risks. And that's certainly what the humanitarian impact approach has been addressing. It's very real in that sense. And the real world, I think, is one in which nuclear weapons are already in the Middle East, and chemical weapons are being used now. Um, and yet there is no pre process to address the issue of WMD in the Middle East anymore. And the real world includes the reality that the Conference on Disarmament, on which the NPT Action Plan depends, is, hasn't achieved anything since 1996. That's nearly 20 years. And the real world is one in which the US-Russia bilateral process has ground to a halt. Um, and this is very real and very worrying. And I think we all know what genuine commitment to progress looks like and smells like. And we all know that that's not happening at the moment in the NPT. So the real world is also what's providing the urgency and impetus for those who are trying new approaches. They're very worried about the future. That's really what it comes down to. So leadership comes in many forms, and we're not seeing it coming from those that possess nuclear weapons. And I, I agree that we shouldn't be putting them all into one box, by the way. I, I think this hasn't worked, and it's a bad idea. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised also that we're starting to see leadership coming from those who see the world perhaps a little bit more clearly um, than others. Um, so what do we do? How do we move forward? And Benno is absolutely right that the more we move from fact-finding, discussion of the, the realities of nuclear weapons, what would happen if they use, what the risks are, and so on, which has been such an interesting discussion for those who haven't participated. Um, but as soon as we do that, it is a non-trivial approach. Once you start having to nail colors to the mast, and once you start having governments being elected and changing and so on, it becomes very messy. Patricia, we're running out of time. Yeah, no, I just want to say, I just I have a question, you see, and it's a really important question because I think we need to think about how we um, arrange a breakthrough in the blocks that have been mm -hmm. identified and see a form of collective leadership, perhaps from some of the nuclear weapon states, some of the nuclear allies, and some of the humanitarian impact um, uh, proponents and see if we can find a way forward because the real world is, is pretty dangerous right now. Thank you. So last three are Oliver, the lady over there, and Mohammed Daraya. Oliver Meyer, German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Um, I also have a, a question on uh, the e e EU's role in, in this um, uh, discussion. Um, yesterday we heard about the uh, important role the EU has played in, in negotiating the Iran deal and the very important role it will have to play in implementing uh, the deal over, over the next uh, couple of years, which will also um, have new requirements, put new requirements on the EU's role in, in nuclear non-proliferation. Today we heard about the problems the European Union had at the NPT review, review conference. While we are sitting here, the EU is um, um, trying to agree on a new security strategy, and the security strategy um, 12 years ago was uh, triggered partly by disagreement over how to address um, proliferation threats um, in Iraq. So my question to the panelists would be, what could be, what should be the level of ambition um, of the EU in the new security strategy, which is going to stay with us, I think, for some time in the context of nuclear non-proliferation, but also more generally in non-proliferation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Tariq. Um, um, my name is Anna Slivon. I represent British Backwash. And I must say that I welcome that we all recognize the difficulties um, that come from the NPT review process and now that the first committee and the outcomes do not offer much hope for progress. Um, but we are not going to escape the structural difficulties and, 
and the political will to make further progress on disarmament may not always be forthcoming. Therefore, this is the time where we NGOs and all members of the nuclear communities across the European states have to keep working together on solutions that could preserve the progress and keep the momentum going. Um, the, I therefore welcome suggestions by Mr. Muller for further ideas for cooperation between experts. And I must say on that note that we at British Pugwash have been working over the last um, two years to establish a nuclear disarmament institute in the UK, which could be a contribution by a nuclear weapon state and to the progress on disarmament and could bring existing expertise from across government departments, laboratories, academia, um, to work together on solutions to disarmament challenges, but not only on the policy side, but on a technical side. But it has been an uphill battle, and even though we received a lot of support from fellow members of the community, we would welcome more support from institutions of the European Union and the government, because this is, this is the last line of defense, in a sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mohamed? Uh, thank you very much. My name is Mohammed Daryai. I'm a university professor. Could you just uh, identify yourself? Yeah. Uh, I, I, my name is Mohammed Daryai. I'm a university professor and also deputy director general at the MFA of Iran. So um, just a comment. First of all, um, humanitarian consequences of, of nuclear weapon and the three conferences that we had create a very strong uh, wave that changed really the discourse around nuclear weapon uh, status and also new nuclear disarmament. And I think that's, that's something that the nuclear weapon uh, states could not digest this movement and that was the, really, uh, the real cause for the failure of, of 2015 MPT uh, failure. Uh, as a person that has been heavily engaged in, in several discussion, I, I, I did several bilateral discussion in the uh, framework of a NAM president with many uh, uh, nuclear weapon states, both individually as a group, and then we, we reached to this common understanding that there is a lack of political will to accept nuclear uh, disarmament commitment or to follow faithfully the nuclear disarmament commitment. And I think that that was evident because we had lack of serious engagement uh, in the past, uh, in, in the first three weeks of, uh, of the negotiation. Last week we had very short, as Gohar mentioned, uh, discussion in Algerian mission. But I think that's, that's, that's the real cause and the real, the real cause was really in this humanitarian issue. We, we try to address the, this dysfunctionality, structural dysfunctionality, as you rightly mentioned, on nuclear disarmament by, by this working group. And again, that, that was another proof that there is a still lack of political will, because we followed two tracks. One uh, was the resolution proposed by Austria and Mexico, which is negotiation and based on GA rules of procedure. And that the second one, which was Iran draft resolution, which was elaboration and based on consensus. So we, we provided enough guarantee for the nuclear weapon state to be engaged in further discussion or elaboration. And they, unfortunately, the, the last minute discussion or that we had with them proved to us that still there is not enough uh, political will to accept further uh, commitment. Of course, I agree that, that the, the situation with regard to nuclear weapon states are different some days. Some of them are uh, relying on, on lack of strategic stability, some of them other excuses, but unfortunately the, the Middle East issue uh, gave them a good excuse to put the blame on the, on, on the uh, Middle East, and then we had a failure on the 2015 conference. Thank, Thank you. you. Two minutes each to the three panelists. Uh, a lot of interesting issues were put up, so can you pick a couple of those and address them, and we can go in the same order, Ben Oak, 
This time we'll put Harold in the middle and then Galkar has the final word. Okay, thank you, Tariq, and thank you to all of you for these good questions and comments. Um, Bob, you're right, we need to have a fundamental rethinking of the review process because what we actually see is that the prep comms are nothing else than mini review conferences. And the prep comms don't really get us any closer to having a successful review conference or to really addressing the issues, maybe more depth before we get to the review conference. So there has to be some thinking of um, restructuring the review process. And, uh, and I think maybe this could be one of the few areas where we could all agree on investing some time, energy, and thinking, um, given the difference we have in the different areas. If we, we could sit down and uh, try and do some thinking on this, this would already maybe be a step forward. But it will still not solve the problem of the political will. I mean, however well the review process is designed, if at the end of the day, the political will isn't there to compromise and to find some middle ground, it will still be difficult to reach a meaningful outcome. On NPDI, I still, I still stand by my comment that NPDI was not able to play this um, bridging role. And I think it became very obvious in the small group discussion, the disarmament focus group, because we had their different representatives from NPDI, but they weren't able to come up with a common proposal to move us cl closer to an agreement. Who can play the honest broker? I, I really don't know, but I think there is definitely a need for some honest broker, and it can't just be one country. It has to be a group of countries to be able to make an impact. Patricia, thank you for pointing out the other real-world issues that need to be discussed and put on the table. And I think you're right that if we want to find a meaningful way of moving forward, it has to be some grouping of some nuclear weapon states and some non-nuclear the weapon states that can somehow work out an agenda and a way forward together. Um, unfortunately, I think this is going to be very difficult in the open-ended working group, given the opposition of nuclear weapon states, if we go by their voting pattern, of engaging in the open-ended working group. So probably there has to be some work done in track 1.5 formats by um, think tanks, like your think tanks, like others who, who, who are the organizers of this conference, in trying to bring together some of the nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states that will be willing to try and identify a common way forward. Thank you. I address uh, three interventions. First, on the EU role. Uh, I think that the Iranian case shows the potential for the EU uh, to be an actor on its own. And I'm always scandalized when I hear uh, about the P5 plus one negotiations it never were P, P5 plus one negotiations. Uh, and that formulation leaves out uh, the self-standing role of the EU. Um, what it shows is that in world-class strategic issues, when the EU countries have a common interest, the EU can act. Uh, we see that, I think, coming now in the Syrian issue. Uh, and there might be more. And I think the, uh, the new version of the strategy should account for that. Uh, secondly, on the honest broker, I don't like the expression so much in international politics. We are all honest, uh, but we are also all pursuing uh, our own national interests and group interests as we are brokering. What I would say is that the history of review conferences shows overwhelmingly that success depends on bridge building groups uh, that contain members from all sides. Uh, and that will remain so, and in that sense, NPDI, I think, has a role to play in future conferences. And the last issue is the interesting question put forward by, by Bob Einhorn. I hesitate, I hesitate to relinquish uh, the objective of achieving consensus, because there are alternatives which are maybe more unpleasant, namely resolution voting. Uh, which is, of course, in the courts and in the procedures and could be done. And if the parties are uh, relieved from the moral pressure to achieve consensus, the temptation to go that road might be very high. And we should never forget that by having a consensus in the end, the NPT community projects a very strong message 
to potential deviators, that we are united on that. Uh, and to just to, to renounce this message as a goal, I think it's risky, because as I look at the divisions in this party community, it's almost traumatic. And that brings me to my last word, which is a response to Tarek's wonderful punctuation poem from the beginning. If we don't overcome this trauma, our future may be short and dark. We will go down, not for a comma, but with an exclamation mark. Thank you. I feel like I shouldn't speak anymore. Um, on um, consensus, I, I agree uh, with Dr. Miller that having a consensus declaration of some kind uh, at the end of a review conference does project that there is a unity among states' parties on, on the health of the regime and on the future of the regime. And, and the lack of that, um, on the one hand, there is a risk of resolution voting, and I think the United States would be the first one to oppose that kind of outcome. Uh, on the other hand, simply ending a four-week conference without adopting anything um, would go down real badly in the diplomatic world and makes it really hard to justify to a government to, to go into a conference like that when you, when you don't emerge with what is considered a product in, in the diplomatic world. That said, yes, the review process absolutely needs um, a, a careful reconsideration. And um, if I may plea with you to come back to the U.S. administration and lead such an initiative from within the U.S., that would be, that would be fantastic. On, uh, on the NPDI, um, to be a bit blunt, I think the group had very good intentions, uh, continues to have them, but never had quite the credibility to be the bridge builder in nuclear disarmament. It just didn't have that in the eyes of a lot of non-nuclear weapon states, primarily in the non-aligned movement. And you've pointed out the membership issue and um, the fact that there's no open tension in the meetings doesn't um, undo the presence of very real differences and profound differences in, in positions on nuclear disarmament and next steps among some of the um, NPDI members. Uh, the group might be going through some soul searching right now as to, to its future and the point of its existence. Um, we could see at the first committee they had a very short statement compared to what they brought to previous meetings. Um, whether there is going to be an emergence of another group to serve this sort of go-between and mediator role, um, not yet. I think some of these realignments that are happening right now, the, the ground shifting, it has to settle down a little bit, um, and then, then we, have, we might see an emergence of a different, different grouping. So far, I think there's very little appetite for bridge building. NAC that had that role before, I think, is very disappointed with the results it achieved um, after 2000 and where the outcome of the 2000 uh, NPT review conference went. So this time they didn't even try to be this kind of bridge builder. They pursued a very clear sort of ambitious disarmament agenda. On, on the what to do, and I, th there are so many statements and questions that bring up the need for dialogue. We need a dialogue. We need to seriously discuss these issues. But so far we haven't been able to move past disagreements on the format, on even the format in which to meet. Um, I see Tom Countryman is nodding because that's the situation with the Middle East as well. Um, and, and I don't have a recipe for that, but, but so far we can't even figure out in what format to have that, that, that kind of dialogue. So I think it's, it's kind of a homework for us all to, to, to see how, how we can overcome that. And, and very briefly on the role of the EU, I'm not a specialist in any, in any shape on the, on, the, on the Union, but considering the again, very serious disagreements within the Union on, on nuclear weapons and the presence of two nuclear weapon states and there and a number of nuclear allies, maybe the U European Union could find space for just that kind of honest, substantive dialogue within uh, about the role of nuclear weapons in European security and European identity. Where do we as a Union stand with regard to the nuclear weapons? How are they compatible with who we are? And, and then take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's a mark of success of our discussion if Harold resorts to poetry. <laughs> so thank you very much to all the three panelists, and thank you for all of those who took the floor. We started 10 minutes late, so with apologies to the organizers, we are 10 minutes late in, in the rail sets. Thank you. We
We start at 10.30 for the next plenary.